We are live. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, call this meeting of the Thursday, December 15th, 2017 Delta Stewardship Council meeting to order and begin with the roll call. Weinberg here. Gatto here. Tatayan here. Pierini here. Thompson here. We have a quorum. Next item is to recess into closed executive session. I believe that. Um, for those of you that are following on the webcast, it will probably take about 30 minutes. Um, tune in again at 2.20 to be sure and catch the, uh, the next segment when we come back into open session. So we are now uh, recessed for closed executive session. Good afternoon. We are uh, reconvening in open session. Uh, no action taken in closed session. We now move on to file item number five, seeking adoption of the November 16th, 2017 meeting summary. Thompson second. moves to tie in seconds. Any discussion on the motion? Tatai and I. Fiorini I. Thompson I. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. On to file item number six, the chair's report. Um, the, um, the first item is to alert you that our executive officer, Jessica Pearson, is on maternity leave and our chief deputy, uh, Jessica Law, will be serving as the interim executive officer until uh, Jessica returns. And we all wish Jessica well in the delivery of her baby that's due sometime early January. Um, I was going to report on the Aqua conference that I attended last week, but time does not allow that. Uh, you have on your table a calendar provided to you by the Delta Protection Commission in conjunction with DWR. Skip Thompson, thank you very much for the calendar. Um, 
the eco chapter amendment work that was presented uh, to you at last month's meeting um, because of the interest that council member Weinberg expressed at that meeting we are punishing him by adding him to the subcommittee that Susan Tatayan and I have been serving on so we now have a subcommittee for the in support of the staff's work on eco chapter amendments one of the things that the subcommittee has been doing is conducting listening sessions uh, with interested parties we began targeting the environmental NGO community because they often are interested in our work but don't often attend our meetings so we have sought out several leaders in that community we have talked to uh, four of the five county ag commissioners we've reached out to Delta Water Agency leaders and we offer to anyone that is interested in coming to the office and uh, providing their views on the ecosystem chapter amendment work that we're doing uh, we'd be happy to schedule the subcommittee to do a listening session uh, and finally following today's council meeting beginning at four o'clock we will be conducting a public hearing to receive comments on the Delta plan amendments draft program environmental impact report during the development of the items included in the um, what we'll be considering this evening we've heard uh, from a few members of the public that they would like to have an evening meeting scheduled so we have heard from uh, our, um, our interested parties and um, following the recommendation of council member Thompson um, we're test driving evening meetings we uh, had one in Stockton for a workshop on November 1st and we will have a meeting this evening so skip we acknowledge your recommendation thank you for that um, that completes the chair's report any comments or anybody else have anything um, to Patrick? I, uh, I, I visited the um, rock pile in Stockton the uh, emergency um, facility that DWR is constructing there uh, where um, it uh, it's going to have capacity for almost 300,000 tons of rock and has um, about 26,000 currently uh, on site so it's substantial and it allows for barges to pull up as many as four to move rock in the case of an emergency uh, so it's an it's it's a uh, terrific partner for reclamation districts for smaller flood fights because it has a lot of equipment and a lot of interaction with the reclamation districts uh, as we heard at our last council meeting and um, it's coming along and in the uh, event of a catastrophe uh, it will serve the state well great that was one of the things that we identified in the early actions proceedings um, during the development of the Delta plan as the need to do that and so it's uh, refreshing to know that uh, recommendations are being followed up on anything else Ken uh, I attended uh, the, the fall aqua meeting Association of California water agencies and um, there was a lot of interesting discussion a big panel and session on on water fix but also there was a a theme that went through almost uh, a lot of the uh, the sessions and the discussion was about funding and where money is coming for statewide needs and it was all pointing you know towards trying to get the water users to uh, to pay for a lot of things and I was in one session on um, restoration projects in the headwaters of uh, in the Sierras and they were even talking about gee you know we need funding and this is a funding source so I think there's a lot of focus and whether you know that's going to be coming out of the legislature but I had to think about well what about levies and where's that coming from but uh, there was a lot of discussion about you know we've got this these huge infrastructure needs that are statewide in nature a lot of it around the Delta and and, and uh, you know water supply and and 
where's the money coming from? Well, maybe it needs to come from the water rate payers on the water bill. So uh, this, uh, I just got the feeling that for the next year, this whole funding discussion is just going to really get raised and it get, gets to our uh, uh, Delta levy investment strategy and, and what we, you know, really kind of shook me is, is there's no money and we've convinced ourselves that bond measures are a stable source of revenue, which obviously that's what is being sought out here. So just something maybe to, to uh, keep watching because it, it gets to a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, either whether it's Delties or, or uh, ecosystem restoration. Okay, thank you, Ken. And I should point out that two of the three keynote speakers at Aqua were members, are members of the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee. Grant Davis, the Director of the Department of Water Resources, and Austin Ewell, the Assistant Deputy Secretary of the Department of Interior. And we got a shout out from Austin on the, uh, the importance of the DPIC. So uh, that, was, that was gratifying to hear. And references to the Delta Plan and uh, the achievement of the co-equal goals. So. Always, always good to hear that we have allies um, uh, advocating our, um, our important role. Um, with that, um, unless there's any requests for public comment, uh, then we'll move on to file item number seven, executive officer's report, Jessica Law. All right. Thank you, Chair Fiorini. Uh, so as you mentioned today, we're holding a public hearing on the programmatic EIR for the CEQA amendments. Uh, I also wanted to let everyone know that we've decided to extend our CEQA comment period until uh, 5 p.m. on Monday, January 22nd. This has been re-noticed. Um, the extension has been re-noticed on our website through the State Clearinghouse and other required noticing locations as well as our listserv. Uh, the extension will result in a comment period of 83 days total. Okay. So on to the weather. If it seems lately we're never more than a year away from drud, from drud, from from flood or from drought. Um, we, that might actually be coming true again this year. Uh, it looks like there's uh, talk of another ridiculously resilient ridge of high pressure that's sitting over California, keeping things dry for at least the next two weeks. Uh, NOAA, the National Atmospheric and um, uh, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration predicts that the next 90 days, both uh, from December through February, is going to have below normal pre precipitation in Southern Sierra with a 50-50 likelihood of drier conditions in Northern Sierra. So I just wanted to use this news as a reminder of our November meeting and the panel discussion on drought uh, synthesis and to let you know that that report through UC Davis is still on track to be released in February, just in time in case we have another dry year. Uh, on to covered action certifications. So there are two uh, certifications I want to bring up. One, the review period for DWR's Decker Island project ended last week without an appeal. Uh, this project is included in the California Eco Restore program, which you hear about often. It's located along the Sacramento River in Solano County. Uh, DWR is proposing to enhance up to 140 acres of tidal wetland, associated high marsh and riparian habitats to benefit special status species like Delta Smelt and Swainson's Hawk. Uh, by lowering a section of levee, reconfig reconfiguring internal berms, and excavating a southern breach, the project will increase site water levels and flow, increase access for fish, and inhibit the establishment of invasive vegetation and enhance access to upland. Uh, the second project is the review period for Reclamation District 2028's Bacon Island Levy Rehabilitation Project ends on Sunday. This project is funded by DWR under the special projects. Uh, the Reclamation District proposes to, re to rehabilitate 4.7 miles of levy along the western side of Bacon Island, including a tow berm, uh, a wider levy crown, and then an all-weather access road. Uh, the project will also plant native grasses on the levee and include a monitoring and management plan based on the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Department of Water Resources guidelines. Council staff had worked with the district in development of their adaptive management plan. 
So in terms of personnel announcements, um, you will be seeing my face for the next few months. Thank you, Randy. <laughs> um, but we also have a new executive fellow uh, who started at the council in December. His name is Seth Yund. He grew up in Stockton, California, and is a graduate of Chapman University. Uh, he has a bachelor's of science in biological sciences with a minor in interdisciplinary studies. He's really excited about working at the council because he said he's interested in gaining experience in how to more effectively bridge the gap between scientific and political communities as well as being better integrated into efforts to design and implement effective policy. So we think he's in the exactly right spot. Seth will be working primarily with Chair Fiorini on special projects and then learning the ropes of legislative analysis and budgeting process with Ryan Stambra and also working with the rest of council staff. Uh, his fellowship is full-time and extends until August 2018. So uh, due to the hearing, he is not here. I believe he has He's an attending a required day-long uh, seminar for the fellows. Yeah. But we will um, get him in front of you uh, uh, early and often. So due to the public hearing today, uh, the council agenda is pretty light. Uh, I don't believe there are any legal updates and no legislative updates for the meeting. So following this report, uh, there will be the lead scientist report, and then I'll present a brief overview of staff's proposal for the five-year review of the Delta plan. Um, and then, all, as always, our agenda items and supporting materials are online or um, at a table in the back of the room. So any questions on that portion of the report? Questions of Jessica? No. Very good. Job, very good. Okay. Any, in, <laughs> Any requests for public comment? Okay, yeah. that's what Okay, so moving on to item 7B, the ecosystem amendment update. So I'd like to call your attention to a memo that's in the council binder on the ecosystem amendment. Uh, we've included this memo as a way of keeping the council and the public informed on progress on that amendment in between presentations at council meetings. Uh, the memo summarizes outreach to date and then includes a progress, um, an update on progress that staff and consultants are making on some of the technical analyses. So Randy had also mentioned that we've been doing a tremendous amount of outreach and listening sessions and we're really welcoming the opportunity to do more. So please contact if you're interested. Um, and other than individualized li listening sessions, we'll have presentations at council meetings, public workshops, and then other venues for for outreach and participation. Uh, right now, the next council presentation is scheduled for February, when staff will provide an overview of synthesis papers and draft performance measures for discussion. And if there aren't any other questions? Any questions of Jessica on the staff report regarding the ecosystem chapter amendment? No. All right, very good. That concludes the executive officer's report. Okay. That concludes file item number seven on to file item number eight, lead scientist report, John Calloway. Thank you, Chair Fiorini and council members. Good afternoon. So today I wanted to present to you two recent papers that came out that have a particular focus on social science issues, since usually we talk about natural science issues, but I intentionally chose two articles that I think are of interest around social science. The first one is uh, Inhabiting the Delta, a Landscape Approach to Transformative Socio-Ecological Restoration by Brett Milligan at UC Davis and one of his PhD students, Alejo Krauss-Polk. And I'll point out that Alejo was an intern at the Stewardship Council in 2013 before he started his PhD. So training those people and getting them out there into programs or into agencies is really critical. And this paper really gives an overview of social issues related to restoration and thinking about how restoration affects the landscape and how to incorporate human aspects into uh, future restoration plans. They, um, one thing I think that's interesting about their paper is it's, they, they use a variety of different approaches. So rather than just one single method, they, they did many things. They reviewed all the current planning and legal issues around restoration, they did questionnaires with land managers, they interviewed land managers, agency staff, interested public. They looked at case studies of nine different restoration projects to see how social issues were incorporated into those case studies. They did mapping to look at the extent of where some of those projects are going. And then they looked at sites out in the field. As they point out, it really is sort of a first step, a diag they call it a diagnostic effort to understand these landscape processes. 
and they really are just really trying to promote that awareness, promote um, uh, what they call, or what they refer to as integrative ad adaptive management, a term that the Delta, Sci the Delta Independent Science Board used to not just thinking about adaptive management from a, a strictly scientific management perspective, but bringing in people and bringing in those um, social issues. So that's the, the first sort of, it, and it's really a pretty general paper, as I said, the first stage in really addressing um, social issues. The so, second. So, John, John yes, on questions. That, does it have some examples? So they do use, um, well, and actually I should say that this, um, it was published in San Francisco Estuary Watershed Science. It's also a more detailed version of it was available as a report, and I'll make sure that if you're interested that report's available. They have nine case studies. Oh, okay. And so for those case studies, they do look at specific examples, and they try to identify, you know, what some of the challenging issues were for the project, what some of the concerns are, what, how, e how issues have been addressed. They look at... A, yeah, so they, they do look at those specific so Delta, examples. Delta, Susun, and the Bay? It's just the Delta. Just the Delta? Yeah. And so all the examples are? Yes, there? all okay. the examples are local. All right, great, thanks. Any other questions? Okay, so then the second paper doesn't have a Delta focus. Uh, I chose it since I'm a wetland ecologist and it has a wetland focus, but also since it has a really strong social economic component to it. And this is looking at flood damage issues associated with Superstorm Sandy on the East Coast. Although it's on the East Coast, it actually was conducted by a researcher, Sid Narayan, from UC Santa Cruz and colleagues from the Nature Conservancy, from uh, uh, a nonprofit that works on risk management issues. One thing I noticed after I had read the paper and looked at it in detail, uh, it was actually funded by um, Lloyd's of London, uh, the foundation associated with Lloyd's of London because it really looks at, um, at those risk issues and they really are trying to raise awareness about um, interactions between ecosystems and flooding and risk. So um, this paper was published in Scientific Reports, which is the online journal of nature, which is one of the most well-respected journals in the country, so it, or in the world, it's, it's a British journal actually. But it, um, so it is high profile. And what they found, what they did was, they, they used two approaches on the whole wet east coast associated with super, sand, super storm Sandy. They looked at um, what the flooding was associated with the storm. They used a hydrologic model to simulate the flooding. So they calibrated the model to, to flood um, just as the actual storm did. And then they converted all the existing wetlands on the east, in that area to open water areas so that they wouldn't have, they, they wouldn't function as wetlands but more as creeks or waterways. And then they re-ran their flooding model with the same storm and they saw how much more of an area was flooded. What they found was uh, a $625 million reduction in flood damages. Um, they found the biggest reduction in flooding was actually in states like Maryland or Virginia, um, where there are still are significant wetlands, but the biggest impacts in terms of financial impacts were in New York and New Jersey because that's where the, the largest development of coastal properties is. Even in New York where there's very, very little remaining wetlands, there still was um, $140 million of flood reduction um, in that area by, by having wetlands present. So. I think they make a strong case that um, there, there, it, there are those significant benefits, people refer to those as ecosystem functions or ecosystem benefits that are provided by those um, wetlands. To support their argument, they also did a, looked at a, a smaller region, a county that's about the same size as the Delta on the New Jersey coast. And in that case, they chose that area because there's specific places where there's regions where there are wetlands in place along the coast, and then nearby there are regions where the wetlands have been lost. And then in that case, they looked at very specific places and said, if you have those wetlands present or not, uh, do you get a significant reduction in wetlands? For this, they didn't use th just one storm, but they ran a whole, they ran actually a thousand different hypothetical storms to see what the average reduction in risk was. And it was about a 15 to 20 percent reduction in um, in losses if you lived behind a wetland than if you didn't have a wetland in front of your property. So um, this, 
certainly has a relevance to us here in the Delta. We don't have hurricanes, so we're not, we don't have those enormous storm surge events that are associated with those kinds of storms. But it really um, highlights the, the, the integration of social science, economic approaches, and physical sciences using that hydrological uh, modeling to, to get at some of those benefits and really show um, the, the values of natural systems. So any questions on that paper? I don't have a, a question, John, but I want to thank you for highlighting this report. I think given climate change and our responsibilities in the Delta, it's really important that we highlight um, that green infrastructure can augment and complement gray infrastructure. Yeah. It's, it's, we're going to continue to integrate our systems, I hope. Yes. I, actually, at one point uh, in the summary that I forgot to mention that they found out that I think also is relevant is um, the effect wasn't just local. Having wetlands in the basin affected areas upstream tens of kilometers, 50 kilometers or, or more away. And so that integration across the system is also important. Okay, so two other um, short things to summarize. Uh, we've had two recent brown bag seminars I wanted to highlight to you. One uh, was presented just uh, a few weeks ago by Stacy Sherman on um, the fish restoration program. And this uh, I um, bring to your attention because it's part of a series of brown bags that uh, the Independent Science Board is sponsoring as part of their review of the monitoring program. This is the first of three. In early January, January 4th, Steve Culberson, the um, IEP lead scientist, will be presenting an overview of IEP monitoring. And then the following day, Karen Larson from the, re the State Board will be presenting on water quality monitoring. And the Independent Science Board is putting on these brown bags for the general public as well as for their own knowledge so they can learn more about real, some specifics about um, Delta monitoring issues that they can incorporate into their report. And um, what Stacy highlighted was, as I mentioned, the fish restoration program that's sponsored by the, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, she gave an overview of the program, which is really designed to restore wetlands, to provide for fish habitat, um, both in the Delta and in Sassoon Marsh, and to um, pr improve survivorships, survivorship for uh, juvenile salmon. She, so, and what, but what she highlighted was the monitoring effort that's currently going on that's being designed to, as more and more restoration projects are taking place, to evaluate the effectiveness of those restoration projects. And what their monitoring is really focusing on, or what she highlighted was the food web component of their monitoring, looking at invertebrate um, populations that are a big part of the fish food web. And so she highlighted what they're doing. Um, she emphasized some things that I think are important. Their, their whole design of their project is linked strongly to conceptual models that have been developed for the Delta so that there's a strong link between what they're monitoring and the challenging issues of understanding those ecosystems are. She also pointed out that they're developing a guidance document, or they have developed a do guidance document that highlights what they're doing so that when other people are out there doing monitoring, they can incorporate the same sort of methods and they, there can be some comparisons across those um, different efforts. And um, then the last thing to mention from that uh, brown bag was it was um, beyond just the presentation. Following the brown bag, there was a panel discussion uh, with experts from Fish and Wildlife, DWR, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to discuss uh, other issues around that sort of monitoring. With each of the upcoming ones, there will be panels as well. And um, talking to the ISB members after the presentation, they felt it was really extremely informative, both the brown bag and the panel discussion. Um, and then the second brown bag um, also was in November and looked at um, a modeling effort called the ELAM, um, which is an abbreviation, uh, and I actually I forgot to write it down, so it's, it's in your summary, I think, but I didn't put it in my notes. Um, but ELAM is a, is a linked physical um, behavioral model, and it's a model that uses um, fish response to flow to understand what fish movements and fish uh, patterns will be under different flow conditions. So it, mo it uses the same sort of physical model as I mentioned, 
might be used for the flooding effort, but instead of linking it to an economic model, it links it to fish behavior. So depending on flow rates or directions of flow, the fish may swim upstream, and, and that's actually all based on um, studies of fish behavior that I'll mention in just a bit in terms of the biotelemetry uh, symposium. Um, and so this model is, uh, we, we highlighted this brown bag because the, um, the science program is really interested in developing uh, more of an effort on integrated modeling, and this is just one example of how different models might be integrated. And um, from this work, they also uh, are able to evaluate individual projects. So one of the examples they used, and that I've mentioned previously, is the YOLO bypass, where they're considering some changes to the bypass to increase the frequency of flooding and to get more fish up into the, onto the floodplain. So the ELAM model was used at one of many models that were used to evaluate where to put that opening, how big it should be, and other characteristics in order to maximize fish use. And so linking the flow with the behavior um, has, is really a, a useful uh, technique. Any questions on either of the brown bags? Okay, and then the last thing to mention is a symposium that we hosted uh, November 9th on biotelemetry that I had mentioned to you uh, previously, and I just wanted to give you a few uh, uh, brief points about the, 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 that overall symposium. As I had mentioned previously, it was, so biotelemetry is the idea of tagging fish with a, a little radio tag that sends out a signal, and then you are able to follow the, f the fish movement. And within the delta, that's been used actively it's been used for many decades, but really actively over the, about the last 10 to 15 years. And there is now um, infrastructure in place with a number of stations all throughout the Delta so that if fish are tagged, they're automatically followed as they move through the Delta. And actually one of the key points I think from the symposium was we need to be sure to support that infrastructure so that we have that in place um, for future studies and um, maintaining that is, is really of value. But um, they highlighted some of the recent uh, results that they found, just highlighting how different survivorship is um, in different parts of the Delta. Um, unfortunately, the survivorship is not so consistent year to year under dry conditions or wet conditions. Areas with good survivorship in one year may have bad survivorship in, the, in another. Um, and it really, a, a, uh, some of that links to um, the physical conditions, but a lot of it also links to predators. Um, they highlighted, there was a question, actually Mike's not here, but uh, Mike had asked last time about what happens if a fish eats a fish that has a tag on it. They're actually now developed, they've developed tags that um, are sensitive to, di to di digestive enzymes so that the tag actually sends a different signal when it's been eaten than when it's on a, on a regular fish. So people are thinking about all those kinds of issues and getting some really valuable information so that we get much better information about not just overall survivorship, but linking survivorship to physical conditions and biological conditions in the Delta. So, um, and then the last thing I wanna point out is um, in terms of the, that symposium, I wanna um, thank Marina Brand, who, has, who is one of the Delta Science Program staff members. That she, she coordinates the symposium and many other things um, for, our pro for our program, and um, this is her last week, or next week will be her last week here at the um, science program, so I wanna thank her on her retirement for all she's done, not just for the symposium, but for many, many other things. And, and with that, unless there's questions, I'll ask Catherine to questions present of by John? the numbers. No, welcome Catherine. Good afternoon, council members and Chair Fiorini. Um, we kind of have a Skittles bag worth of colors for our numbers this month. Um, looking at precipitation, I think um, kind of piggybacking on what Jessica Law had talked about earlier, people were expecting to have a little more rainfall, which we haven't really seen so far. Um, since we reported on these numbers last month, the northern Sierras have received an additional 4.2 inches of rainfall, and this is 92% of the historical average, so not bad. Um, in last year, we're still a little bit behind of where we were, so this time last December, we um, 
had 11.2 inches more than we do currently. Um, but again, last year was also an unseasonably wet year. Um, and so in the 2015 year, um, we are two inches ahead of that. So kind of straddling those two extremes. In terms of the Central Sierra, this number is definitely not where we would hope it to be. It's, you know, at 50% of the average. Um, however, this is only seven inches less than this time last year. And then in 2015, um, it's only a couple inches more. So hopefully we'll be getting some more rain in the coming months. If you go to the next slide, I have a map. Um, it did not fit in the by the numbers report, but it's a really nice graphic that kind of shows the disparity in um, rainfall that we've had in these past two years. So it really brings home that we have not gotten as much rain as we did last year. Um, moving on, this is also um, a predicted map that was created by NOAA to kind of look at the forecast for rain in the coming month. And as you can see, we're not uh, scheduled to get rain until 2018. We do, however, have, oh, I think one more should be a snowpack. Uh -oh. Well, I guess it got cut out. Sorry about that. Anyway, so for people who have the uh, paper copy, we finally started the um, snowpack and snow water equivalent measurements. And so we, unfortunately, all of those numbers are pretty low. In the Northern Sierras, we have 1.9 inches. In the Central Sierras, 2.9 inches. And then the statewide average is 2.3. And this is all kind of hovering at below 50% of where we have been for our historic average. Um, so this time last year, we, while we were ahead significantly for rainfall, we were definitely still behind um, for the average percentage of snowpack. But if you look at 2015, where we had definitely reduced rainfall compared to 2016, our snowpack was greater. So uh, some researchers have said that, you know, because of different changes in seasonality, especially if you look at this storm we had in November, that brought us a lot of rain. However, it was warmer than usual. And so we saw lots of rain instead of snowpack. Moving on to reservoir storage. Um, these numbers are all looking good with the exception of the continued construction at Oroville. So these are all great and above their um, long-term average. Going to flow, we're seeing some decreased numbers. Next slide, please. Thank no, that's fine. Um, so at Freeport, while the flow has increased um, a little more, or actually decreased. It's a little um, more than 4,000 CFS less than last month. This is still well below the average for this time of the year. Um, last year, we were about 5,000 more. However, if you compare this to 2015, um, we were at around 10,000 CFS. So it's kind of, again, straddling the midline of these two um, very different water years that we've had. Um, at Vernalis, the um, flow has decreased just a little bit since last month, but it is still well um, above what we had in 2016 and 2015 when we were hovering around 24 and 34% of the historical average. So at the Central Valley Project and State Water Project, we've seen a small increase since last month. Um, and again, this is still less than, or actually more than our water years for the past two years, which is nice to see. Um, our salinity values, we have a new addition to the by the numbers. Um, we will be reporting kind of a range of values that can be approximates for the micro Siemens per centimeter and those will be reported in parts per million. So those are just kind of featured right under the colored numbers. And the salinity values are still very similar to what we had for last month. Um, and at Vernalis, it's slightly increased and it was presumably a result of the decreasing flow that was associated. Moving on to our fish numbers. Question. Um, so if you take a poor year, I mean a poor flow in the Sacramento and a fair flow in the San Joaquin, how do you end up with a good flow for the two water projects? That is a good question. Um, I had talked to Reiner and talked to John about it, and we were not. So, because well, the, they're, they're moving water south, so that's the, the diversion. Is it? 
Well, so the, the reason I ask the question, one of the overriding issues is the fear that there will be excessive water exported from the north to the south, excessive to the needs of the ecosystem. So when I see a, a poor and a fair for flows generally, but then a good export amount, it's less is going what, what, how, how, do you re, how do you resolve that apparent conflict? I, 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 don't, I think one month it's not. Uh, I think you have to look over to, over multiple months. So I think let, let's wait and see till next month if we have that continuing. I think there were some shifts in, in um, reservoir releases that may result in the Sacramento inflow being somewhat lower. Because that to me is the surprise is that the Sacramento River was, that the flow on the river is low at this time of year. I, I think the 10,000 may be an error. Is there any value in taking a longer range look by the numbers? I mean, th this is good. Yeah. But this is, this is a snapshot. Yeah. Can we develop anything beyond the snapshot, I mean, for purposes of getting a better understanding of what the future looks like? If there's interest, we can. We could, um, you know, we have the previous one, so we could put a compilation so that you see not just one month, but maybe on the backside, or I mean, yeah. we, don't, we don't want it to get too big and too detailed. No, no, but we no. could um, compile the previous month so that you see sort of a running trend of, you know, are we doing really well, and then there's one unusual month, and then back to normal, or is it I, more I consistent? It helpful, yeah, you could show it in yeah. graphic form. We could, we'll, we'll look into do, developing a graph for that. Okay. And then, you could just add a couple of lines of highs and lows or average and so there'd be a little more um, relationship to the current conditions yes Ken yeah there you know December the, the, in in looking at flows at, at banks it's really important to know that there's constraints for you've got the fall run salmon so exports are constrained in the fall there's different sort of windows so typically the only unconstrained window is is in the summer so this is saying 100 i mean that number looks big it's saying 145 percent of uh, the 20 year december flow average december i think is one of those months that you you got to ratchet back on the exports because of the fall run and then you've got the winter run after that so that may play into comparing it just to to that month without what the restrictions are so you know every time you drill into this the picture just gets bigger and and more complicated so that may be something to to go back and look at is how do those restrictions yeah, which which restrictions is yeah flow yep because i was just looking at i went i looked ahead and, and looked at the winter run salmon juveniles and see the number is uh in red but that's the winter run so i don't know what the fall run i can't remember what that looked like and i can the record reflect mr chair that i said thank you for the additional salinity and i'll never talk about it again i was just really happy when i saw it i go now i understand <laughs> yes all right well um as Councilmember Weinberg mentioned, the only other number we have left to report is the winter run Chinook salmon. And so this, these are, this number is an estimate of the out-migrating individuals from Red Bluff Diversion Dam. And so the number is red. Um, on the screen, all of those graphs are very tiny, but on the printout, you can kind of have a better look and see um, how the estimate has changed over the past six years and get a feel for what things are like um, following more wet or dry years. And I had mentioned last month that I was hoping to get a copy of the Green Sturgeon technical report, but that is still not out yet. So I'm hoping I will have it for my final by the numbers report, which will be for January. Any questions? Catherine, thank you. John, that's it? Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Any requests for comment on this matter? All right.
then we shall move to file item number nine. This is the last item on our meeting agenda. Um, keep in mind that uh, we have 25 minutes before the public hearing starts. So uh, Jessica Law, file item number nine, Delta Plan five-year review. Okay, thank you. Review. All right. Okay, so council members, the purpose of this briefing is really just to provide you an overview of what council staff are thinking and what we're proposing um, on how to address the five-year review of the Delta plan. So a little bit of it is a review and um, bringing the public up to speed on what we're proposing and um, there's definitely a little bit of time for questions at the end. Okay, so Delta plan, preparing for the five-year review. So what's in the Delta plan? Comprehensive recommendations, regulations, and performance measures. Uh, the Delta Plan itself was developed over the course of several years, really with hundreds of hours of public input. Uh, it's always been intended to be a living document, and as such, uh, really needs to be comprehensively reviewed at least every five years. Um, so the Delta Reform Act calls for the council to review the plan once every five years. Um, and it's really a review, and it says that within the Reform Act that it may revise it as deems necessary. So far, the council has only amended the Delta plan twice, uh, single year water transfers and performance measures. Of course, we are working today on a set of amendments and we'll have the public hearing on that CEQA document and we are working on an amendment to the ecosystem chapter throughout the course of next year. Um, for all of these amendments, uh, it's, these have all been very topic specific or focused on specific policies or portions of the plan. It hasn't been a comprehensive review of the plan to date. So in addition to requiring adaptive management for certain proposed covered actions, the council in the Delta plan committed to using adaptive management to develop, implement, and update the Delta plan. So this is a three phase cycle, one plan, so development of the Delta plan itself, do implementation and oversight of the plan, that's the work that we do on a daily basis, uh, evaluate and respond, which is really the update and evaluation and revision portion of the plan and the adaptive management cycle. So that phase three, evaluate and respond, um, within the Delta plan, it describes the scope for updating and revising the Delta plan. Uh, the plan says that the council will consider information from other adaptive management activities in the Delta, an evaluation of Delta plan policies and recommend recommendations, performance measures, and other completed plans or reports related to the Delta. It says that the council will rely in large part on the Delta Science Program for determining the relevance, value, and reliability of the best available science and for organizing that information for use in the council's decisions. All of this information is contained currently in Chapter 2 of the Delta Plan, which really describes Delta Plan governance and implementation. So um, staff have a proposed approach to reviewing the plan for the five-year review. So it's a four-step process. One, an initial assessment. Two, evaluation of the plan implementation efforts. Three, development of a recommendations report. And then four, Delta plan chapter revisions and a schedule moving forward. So for the initial assessment, staff would conduct an initial assessment of the Delta plan content and evaluate the need for changes. So the narrative would be re reviewed for basic cleanups and updates. Uh, so for example, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was adopted in 2014 or passed by the legislature in 2014. That wasn't envisioned or that wasn't a part of the Delta plan originally. There's a lot that's happened since 2013. Some of it was envisioned by the plan and a lot of things have been just have come about. And so we wanna be able to review the plan and the narrative and make sure that we're capturing all of the, all of the accomplishments over the past five years. Um, so in other ways, uh, references, for example, to the Bay Delta Conservation Plan could be removed or clarified or otherwise updated. Um, and then dates or references associated with major plans such, such as the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan would be reviewed. So really just sort of an initial, initial assessment of what's in the plan. Uh, the second step would be an evaluation of plan implementation efforts. So this would be on two parts. Um, so staff would conduct really a high level assessment of the plan performance and implementation by reviewing our administrative performance measures and then early consultation and covered action process. 
the review of administrative performance measures uh, was actually started in 2016 at the Delta Plan Interagency Implementation Committee meeting. We asked for the committee members and their staff to participate and engage with us on a review of those admin performance measures. So we've started to meet with those agencies already. There's really sort of an unequal distribution of performance measures among the DPIC agencies. So for example, Department of Water Resources has 20 plus administrative performance measures. Some of the fed federal agencies have very few. So we're working agency by agency to review those administrative performance measures and get feedback from the agencies. Um, and then also on early consultation and covered action process, uh, staff over the past few, month, few months have really initiated a process internally to review our procedures and think about um, that in the context of the five-year review of the plan. So the third step would be development of a recommendations report. So this is where this all comes together. Staff would uh, develop a new executive level recommendations report to include the outcomes from the initial assessment and evaluation of the plan implementation efforts. The report would describe also the major accomplishments of the Delta Plan over the past five years, um, the, really the initial five years of implementation, identify major policy and management challenges uh, to anticipate in the next five to 10 years. So it would also make recommendations on how to strengthen the Delta Plan and the Council's role to achieve the co-equal goals. So staff is really recommending that we take a proactive approach to developing an action plan for future amendments and revisions to the Delta Plan. And that would include a proposed schedule for future amendments. And we would include that in the report. Overall, the document would be similar in format maybe to the Council's annual reports, but with more detailed and more of a future focus moving forward. So the fourth phase of this is Delta Plan chapter revisions and really sort of setting out a schedule. So staff at this point is not proposing reissuing a fully revised Delta Plan. There will be, however, sections or even chapters of the Delta Plan where, there, where the narrative text would be updated. So for example, chapter two, the Delta Plan chapter that I just talked about, um, that includes information about how the plan would be implemented and that would really be a likely candidate for review and revision to that text. Additional chapters may require cleanup uh, with other narrative text, um, but right now we are not expecting that any of the revisions would trigger an environmental review uh, under the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, so for example, this review is really not expected to add regulations or recommendations to the Delta Plan, but instead really focus on identifying the need for and the timing of future substantive amendments. So in terms of, proposed schedule. Next year is looking like it's going to be a very busy year, um, but staff work on this would begin in uh, really early next year, January, February. Uh, we would plan on bringing a presentation or progress update to the council in spring on both the initial assessment and the evaluation of plan implementation, um, and then conduct another council presentation in the fall with the goal of finalizing the reports and the review by the end of next year, 2018. So that's all I had. If there are any questions, I'm happy to address them. Questions for Jessica? Ken? Yeah, I think maybe, Jessica, you can clarify. The, they're not triggering CEQA because we, we're doing amendments, right. the CSO, the ecosystem restore, performance measure I mean all that we did do CEQA on mm -hmm. so there are changes being made to the plan that you are you saying that these other sort of hey we're just going to clean up some things or if we add you know an executive summary those are not those don't need to go through a CEQA review it doesn't change the the environmental documents that Correct. or the project or how, how but seek was a part of amending and if you could say we need to um, do amendments on other chapters then that could trigger trigger the its own CEQA process correct okay yes. so just wanted to to, to make that's that a good clear. clarification thank you um you know it, i understand it's not a complete rewrite of the of the plan but mm -hmm. You know, my question is, we've been making all these changes. Mm -hmm. We've got a 2013 plan. This is a, I'm gonna guess this very ambitious schedule. I'm gonna call it the 2019 update. 
because it's going to be really hard to, to do all this within the next year. But whatever it is, 2018 or 2019, shouldn't we compile a new plan as opposed to the, and I'm not sure what the thinking is, you know, right now you got the 2013 plan out there and then you have to, you know, go to links on amendments. It seems like we're going through this process. We should come up with a new document. It doesn't have to be wholesale changes, but we've added chapters and we've made changes and this should be, it's either the 2018 plan or it's the 2013 plan updated in, in 2018, but we should have a new document and if we print them, it, it just, I, I would think that that would be something to say, hey, we're, right. we're up to date, we're not talking about something in 2013, we've updated it, conditions have changed, we're reflecting that, we're reflecting all this amendment processes that mm -hmm. we've gone through, which also includes public participation. And mm -hmm. I'd be interested to hear your view on that, how public participation works into the update. Mm -hmm. So to answer your first question about sort of what the ultimate document will look like, um, I think part of that is going to be determined by the initial assessment and the evaluation that staff goes through of the sort of the level of detail that needs to be changed in the plan. And so I think that would be a really good thing to bring back to the council next spring. I think the intent is really to make sure that we have a refreshed document. We really do want this to be a living document and to not not just reflect 2013, but really be reflective of where we are in 2018, or thank you, possibly 2019. So I think the the idea is to really have that look. So whether it's a different cover page, you're asking for more substantive things too, but I think that's definitely on the table in terms of consideration. Um, in terms of public outreach, uh, at this point, we have not scoped out a public outreach process for this. Of course, all the work that we do, we really try and be open and transparent about it. We always work to engage the public. So whether or not we continue with the process of doing listening sessions or we reach out to the public in a different way, whether it's a survey format or we hold a special workshop or whatever options, we're definitely open to suggestions on that from council members, but that's a step that we just haven't gotten to yet in terms of scoping out the review of it. Yeah, M Mr. Chair, uh, you know, I asked the council to, and staff to think about, you know, we're, we're embarking on this update process and that how we communicate to the public should be under the umbrella of the update as opposed to, hey, we've got this one amendment and this. It's, so it's all, you know, it's all a single process and we should look at it that way and that's mm -hmm. why you know I think at the end of the process we should have a new document that has a different cover on it whatever that cover says but it, we've put one document together in one place and that's the updated plan sure I, th I, I think that's the the expectation um, when the California water action plan was updated they they now refer to the current version as 2.0 um, we could go apple and name it a, after an animal or something like leopard, but snow leopard, I think, isn't that an operating <laughs> system? So <laughs> I, think, I think we'll, oh, we'll, uh, we'll leave it up to staff to come back with a recommendation. But um, at the end of the day, uh, when the five-year review is done, Sigma will have been incorporated, uh, the 2015 water bond will be referenced and included. Um, the you know thing, things like that the BDCP will be treated differently than it was in 2010 so this will all be updated it's going to require many many pages to be rewritten and I'm I'm expecting uh, one of our Jessica's to at some day bring us a, a CD or um, a stick that we can stick in the computer and pull up the the brand new refreshed version mm -hmm. and maybe at that time it will include some uh, amendments that have gone through the EIR process that will have be ready to include by then too. So, Patrick? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I would hope that this could be completed by uh, the end of 2018. Um, there's an election, there'll be a new governor, there'll be legislative changes. Um, it would be a good time, not in the plan, but um, in transmitting the plan to the legislature and the governor 
to reflect on what the council has learned and perhaps some recommendations to the legislature that might you know consider both governance issues but policy uh, issues as well and that may stand outside of it but uh, I think uh, a new governor and the legislature would welcome some comprehensive but um, understandable summary of where we are and uh, thanks for that and I think that um, uh, that adds um, value to what staff's goal is and uh, that was partially what was driving that some of our workload will be outside of our control over this next year but I, I think it's entirely doable to have uh, an updated refreshed Delta plan by the end of next year mm -hmm. I'll do everything I can to help make that happen any other questions certainly this is uh, our staff is open to suggestions as you have more time to review maybe throw open a chapter and take a look at it some things may come to mind and um, Jessica's staff will be more than eager to hear from you so mm -hmm. the next check-in uh, remind me is going to be probably spring, spring. 2018 okay okay all right Susan I just wanted to say thank you very much for including chapter two in the packet it, it's a good refresher mm -hmm. and and very clearly written so thank you yeah each time we begin to review a chapter in detail we're reminded of what great work was done years ago it was a lot of effort uh, thanks uh, on, largely in part to all of the input that we received from stakeholders and interested parties uh, do we have any requests for public comment on this matter then um, we have eight minutes before the hearing begins so we will recess now and reconvene at one minute to four All right, the, uh, we are now back in open session and uh, proceeding on to file item number 10. Good afternoon, I am Randy Fiorini, Chair of the Delta Stewardship Council, and this is the time and place for the public hearing to receive comments orally and or in writing on the Delta Plan Amendments Draft Program Environmental Impact Report which for convenience we'll refer to as the draft EIR. Let the record reflect that it is four o'clock on Thursday, December 14th, 2017, and we are here today at the West Sacramento Civic Center Galleria, 1110 West Capitol Avenue, West Sacramento, California. Before I begin, I have a couple of general announcements. First, please look around now and identify the exits closest to you. Should an alarm sound, we will be required to evacuate this room immediately. In that event, please take your valuables with you. Second, please silence your cell phones or other devices now. Now, turning to the subject of today's hearing, the Council prepared the draft EIR pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, in order to analyze the potential environmental impacts of proposed amendments to the Delta Plan involving one, the Delta Levees Investment Strategy, two, Delta Water Conveyance Storage and Operations, and three, performance measures. The Delta Plan is a planning level document that contains both policies and recommendations to achieve the COEQUAL goals and objectives of the Delta Reform Act, as well as performance measures to assess whether the objectives of the Delta Plan are being met. 
The proposed amendments address Delta levy investment prioritization, promote options for new and improved infrastructure relating to water conveyance, storage systems, and operations in the Delta. The proposed amendments also include a number of revised performance measures containing qualified or otherwise measurable targets to be used as indicators of whether the Delta plan is meeting its objectives. CEQA requires that the draft EIR inform the public and the council about the reasonably identifiable potential environmental impacts of the proposed Delta plan amendments. To that end, the draft EIR show, should review the potential environmental impacts at a level appropriate for the broad plan level nature of these proposed amendments. This type of EIR is called a program EIR. CEQA requires the draft EIR to address the potential impacts of amending the Delta plan at the same level of detail as the plan. For individual projects that may someday be proposed and that fall within the scope of the Delta plan, CEQA requires that the draft EIR acknowledge the possibility that these types of projects may be proposed in the future, but allows for the fact that the details of such projects are not known at this time. CEQA also requires, and the council expects, that the environmental impacts of specific projects proposed in the future at specific locations which are within the scope of the Delta plan will be analyzed at a project level by the lead agencies for such projects. Now turning to how we got to this point and where things go from here, the council held a number of public meetings over the past year or so to discuss the proposed amendments. And in June 2017, the council approved proposed amendment language for review as the proposed project under CEQA. The council released the draft EIR for public review on November 1st, 2017, and the written comment period began on that day. The written comment period has been extended and ends on January 22nd, 2018. After today, you can submit written comments on the draft EIR at our offices at 989th Street, on the 15th floor in Sacramento, in person until 5 p.m. on Monday, January 22nd, 2018, by mail to that same address postmarked no later than January 22nd, or by email until 5 p.m. on January 22nd at the following address, Delta Plan, capital letters P-E-I-R, at deltacouncil.ca.gov. In all, the council has provided a written comment period of 83 days. The council will consider all written and oral comments submitted or made during the comment period concerning the draft EIR and environmental issues. We will prepare written responses to those comments, issue the final EIR, and then hold a public hearing to consider whether to certify the EIR and adopt the Delta Plan amendments. Now turning to the process for today's hearing, the council's main role in today's hearing is to listen to the public comments on the draft EIR and the potential environmental impacts of the proposed Delta Plan amendments. We want to make sure that everyone who wants to provide comments has an opportunity to speak. To the members of the public here today to comment on the draft EIR, please listen closely to the following instructions. To my colleagues on the council, please withhold comments until we've heard from the members of the public and the public hearing is closed. This entire hearing will be recorded by a certified court reporter. The transcript of the hearing and all written materials presented during the hearing will be made part of the administrative record for the Delta Plan amendments as appropriate. As with all public council meetings, this meeting is being webcast on the internet and the audio and video will be available for later review. Commenters speaking today will not be sworn in. If you wish to provide comments, we ask you to fill out a blue speaker card, be found on the table to my right. If you do not wish to provide comments, but would like to receive notices related to the draft EIR and the Delta Plan amendments process, we would ask you to fill out one of the attendance sheet at the side table. 
If you wish to submit written comments at this meeting, please give them to Amanda Bull. Amanda, please hold up your hand. Thank you. Who is seated at the side table and will now raise her hand. <laughs> Just to be doubly sure. We will take public comments in the order we receive the completed blue speaker cards. Again, after we hear from everyone who has filled out a speaker card, we will close the public hearing and hear from the council members. In order to allow everyone the opportunity to speak, we will impose a three minute time limit on each speaker and in the interest of time, respectfully request that you summarize any written comments you have or will submit. Similarly, if you agree with comments made by a prior speaker, simply state that fact and add any new information that you feel is pertinent to the issue. Finally, when you come up to speak, we ask that you do a couple of things so that the council, audience, and court reporter may hear you and so that your comments are entered into the record and can be responded to appropriately. First, speak into the microphone. And second, please begin by stating your name and identifying the organization you represent, if any. We will now begin receiving comments starting with the first blue card, of which at this time we have none. So I just want to, uh, before we start with the public hearing, or I guess uh, as part of this public hearing, I just want to uh, thank all of the members of the public who submitted written comments, and I want to assure you that um, that I have read them, and I know uh, most of my peers, or probably all of them, have read them as well. Thank you to everybody out there who has submitted your emailed comments and your written comments. Uh, they really do help us do our job. So just to put everybody at ease, we're here um, at the pleasure of the public who may arrive at 4 o'clock or 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock. So I, um, I, I pledge to be here until the, um, the advertised ending of this hearing, which is 7 o'clock. And at that time, uh, we will close the hearing and provide council members an opportunity for comments. Um, we may be spending some time sitting here looking at each other. You're, you're free to wander about, walk around. Um, when we have a request to make comments, um, just don't stray too far because we'll want to be available.
Oh, thank you, Bob. It's now 4:17. Uh, we have no currently we have no requests to address the council, so I'm going to recess the meeting until we have um, a request to present, and then we'll reconvene. So we're this public hearing is in recess until uh, we have a reason to reconvene. Okay, we will now begin receiving comments, starting with Roger Tebow. Thank you. Welcome, Roger. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, this is not the first time I've had the pleasure of addressing you. I've been to several of the other meetings that have been held um, in the Delta and in downtown. And of course, my main concern is the conveyance system and the fact that you, the Delta stewards, are basically going to recommend the tunnels as the preferred conveyance system of water through the Delta. I grew up in the Delta in the late 50s, early 60s. I was lucky enough that my parents had a boat we kept at B&W on a McCullamy. And I remember when the Delta was alive. I remember when we would catch, oh, 25, 30 stripers in a couple hours, as much catfish as you could find a hole in. Uh, the salmon one runs were prodigious. Uh, the smelt, uh, they would rent rowboats at B&W, and guys would go out with a little dip lantern and a dip net and uh, fill the boat up with shad. That doesn't happen anymore. Since the early 60s and the implementation of the first drain off of the Delta waters through Pat Brown's little fiasco, um, the biological realities of the Delta have continually deteriorated. The fish population in 1960 was estimated at 17 million, all types of fish. The fish population now is estimated at 4 million. Now think about that. In my lifetime, I'm 70 years old, in my lifetime, I've watched two-thirds of the fish population in the Delta be decimated. And why were they decimated? Lack of water, lack of flow. I've watched areas like, oh, say, behind Snodgrass Slough, behind Walnut Grove. In 1960, you could get in there with a boat that drafted three or four feet of water and still have water under your hull. Last time I was there, I was in an outboard and I had to tip the outboard up to get over all the sediments that had built up because there's not enough water flowing through the delta to keep it healthy and to keep it what it should be. So I have a major concern when the Delta Commission, now your job is to be stewards for the Delta, not stewards for Santa Barbara County, not stewards for Orange County, not stewards for Stuart Resnick and Wonderful Farms, not stewards for Jerry Brown. Your job is to be stewards of the Delta and do the best things that can be done in the Delta for the Delta. That's what the stewardship's all about. Now when I see that this 
steward commission is recommending against the recommendations of every fishing group on the coast against the recommendations of every environmental group that you can name everybody has come out and said these tunnels are going to ruin the delta they're going to kill the fisheries they're going to have an absolute horrid effect on an area that we love i've been to several of these meetings and i know that you have all sat through hours and hours and hours of people coming up and telling you that and yet it doesn't seem to sink into you you're still recommending the tunnels now either you're jerry brown's lackeys unable to make a decision crafted on what is best for the area that you've been entrusted to represent or what other possible solution is there oh maybe you believe that this is the best way to convey water even though every environmental group every fishing group everybody that lives in the delta drive down the delta and look at the science everybody agrees that this is a bad horrid plan and yet here are the stewards of the delta still recommending it despite all the testimony that you've heard now dwr they've done a wonderful job up in oroville and they're doing a wonderful job right now of spending taxpayers money on a private enterprise the peripheral canal was put to a vote of the california taxpayers and voted down strongly what are the tunnels but the peripheral canal with dirt thrown on top of them it is the peripheral canal it's just got dirt on top of it instead of an open ditch the people of california told you don't do this and yet dwr and this committee has gone ahead with blind design just wonderfully in step with governor brown and corporate agriculture the southern san joaquin valley which would kill every fish in the state if they can make a profit growing trees in the desert not row crops that when we have a dry year it can be just let fallow no these are pistachios and almond trees that require water all the time and they're growing this in a desert well how are they going to do that well you know how they're going to do that with your help they're going to steal our water kill our fish and make millions of dollars in the short term until all the selenium which is inherent in the southern san joaquin valley might i remind you of the kester uh kesterman uh runoff Kesterson. Kesterson thank you that runoff and you know right now that Westlands is trying to get a waiver on their responsibility to clean up any future runoffs <laughs> how can you not as stewards for the Delta see this and react to it in a proper manner in a proper manner is not to recommend the tunnels as the primary conveyance of water in our state <laughs> I, I just don't know how to say it more strongly how can this happen how can you if you are stewards for the Delta go against all the Delta residents all the fish have been all the environmental groups everybody but the people who are going to make water money out of this deal and this is a money-making deal for corporate agriculture in the San Joaquin Valley. And that's all this is about. Stuart Resnick gives millions of dollars to the Los Angeles Art Museum so that he can be their Democratic favorite and get away with this stuff. It's reprehensible. If indeed you are the stewards of the Delta, then you cannot in good faith and please, you know, I justify it. How you can go against all the residents, all the fishermen, all the environmental groups. Everybody's have come out and said, these tunnels are a fiasco, except for the people that are going to be making money on it. The last time I was at one of these hearings was downtown. 
and all the locals are up and they're screaming and yelling and you know acting like people that are having their environment ripped out from under him. And then the people that I referred to as suits came up and they were all from Southern California and they all said, well, this is a good idea. Of course, these people don't understand what's going on. We understand, you know, well, we're the movers and shakers in this state. We get things done. Well, it's time to bring that kind of um, thing to a halt. It's time that you do what you're supposed to do. Be stewards for the Delta and do the right thing for the Delta. Keep the Delta alive. Keep the fish alive. And make a decision that is not going to recommend the tunnels as the major conveyance. It's, it's just no way that you can call yourself stewards and do that. If you make that decision, please don't call yourself stewards because you're not stewards. You are the lackeys of big business and big government in California. It's really interesting that 50 years ago, everybody would say, you know, those people in LA, they're coming up to get our water. Well, it wasn't the people in LA. Matter of fact, Santa Monica just yesterday came out and said that they're not going to take any more imported water, either from Northern California or the Colorado River. There are ways to meet our water needs in this state without absolutely screwing over the Delta. And any recommendation that the conveyance is the proper way to get water through the Delta into San Francisco Bay and to flush San Francisco Bay out. Let's not forget San Pablo Bay in the North San Francisco Bay used to have a thriving shrimp industry. It doesn't have that anymore. I was watching Hugh Hauser the other day and he was uh, interviewing a man from uh, China Camp, which is over by around the corner from San Rafael. And the, the man said, uh, well, yeah, my relatives uh, have been here for 100 years, and we used to shrimp here, but we don't do that since they started shipping water south. Well, you all being a good Los Angelinos, just shined right by that and went to something else. And the guy, a couple of sentences later, said, yeah, we used to have a great shrimp industry here until they started sending water south. We used to have a fabulous... Um, uh, fishery too, f um, I forgot the small type of fish it is, but people would come from Alaska if they could get a permit into San Francisco Bay because there was so much fish to be taken. That doesn't happen anymore because the water's not there. The ecosystem is not properly flushed out the way nature designed it over hundreds of thousands of years. Now you're going to go in and for the profitability of some guys growing uh, as pistachios in the San Joaquin Desert, you're going to kill that all off? Well, I don't know who you answer to. I don't know who your bosses are. When you leave here and you have to go back and check in with people, I, I, truly, I don't know who that is. I know you were pointed by somebody. But if that person is somebody from the state of California that's telling you, you know, this is our plan, we gotta get this. Uh, we know there's a lot of opposition to it. Your job is to sit there and take the flack. And when it's all said and done, you're gonna vote for this conveyance and these tunnels. And that's the way it appears to everybody that has been at these meetings over this last many months. Because other than the people making money on this thing, there is nobody recommending this as the proper way to solve the water conveyance problem. Nobody other than the people making money on it. You're the Delta stewards on behalf of the Delta, on behalf of the residents of the Delta, on behalf of the fish, on behalf of the wildlife, on behalf of what has made the Delta what it is today, I beg you not to recommend the Delta tunnels as the primary conveyance of water. Thank you. Amanda, do we have any other requests to address the council? Not currently. All right, at this time then we will recess until we have uh, additional requests to address the council.
Thank you, Bob. It's now 7 o'clock. Is there anyone else who wishes to comment on the draft EIR? Hearing no further requests, we will now close the public hearing. Please recall that the written comment period will remain open until Monday, January 22nd, 2018. Please keep an eye out for notices regarding future meetings in which the Council will consider the EIR and the Delta Plan amendments. Would any of the Council members like to speak? Seeing no hands. Um, I'll thank all the participants and attendees. This hearing is now adjourned. That completes file item number 10. File item number 11 provides an opportunity for public comment on any matter. Would anyone wish to speak? Seeing none, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>